Namaskar and welcome to this exciting episode of Satology Debunking Mythology. Satology means science of truth. Opposite of that is mythology, which means science of fake lie imagination, or study of fake lie imagination. Mythology destroys our identity and Satology builds our identity. And this word is especially coined for the Western propagandists who claim to know everything and they brand everything. This is mythology and this is mythology. You know, in Sanskrit word, better words for this thing can be itihas and can be Puran. Puran is also itihas. So without delay, I have a very, very special guest. He's a PhD and he does a lot of research and very famous across India now. And uh, he's writing books also. So without delay, let's welcome Dr. Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Thank you, Satsangiji. Namaskar. Namaskar. You know, aapne Satsangi ji bulaya, and which is very unique for me. Aditya ji. <laughs> very few people call me. No, I like it. It's very few people call me that way. So, uh, so Dr. Roy, before we start off, the there is a lot of propaganda in the Western campuses against yoga, or call, calling it a Eastern cult also to some extent. Now, people do not know the definition of cult is one way in and no way out. In yoga, you can leave anytime you want. So there is no entry barrier, no exit barrier. So how informed are these people to call that a, a mythology or use some pejorative words like cult? Uh, Aditya ji, I think uh, this is uh, a very wrong perception on their behalf. And uh, the beauty of uh, our culture, our civilization, uh, is that uh, we always consider the welfare of everyone. Uh, and so yoga is for the welfare of everyone. Uh, we never kind of uh, like restricted the well-being to only ourselves because uh, we always prayed for well-being of everyone. We always said, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina. Let everybody be happy. We never distinguished between, like we, we never asked for uh, like pain or suffering for anyone. And that's why you will see that in our history, the Indian kings, they never attacked uh, what was considered the outside of India. So uh, the, our message uh, is of love and peace uh, and well-being. And uh, yoga is very integral part uh, of our culture and civilization. And uh, I think it is very wrong uh, to appropriate it or to claim that uh, the yoga poses have come from West and all that kind of thing. You know, when we, when we say we have not attacked anyone, we are assuring the enemies that we are not going to attack also. And that's why we get attacked, you know. Right. So uh, there are very few instances in which the enemy was uh, uh, like pursued well beyond the boundaries of India, and those were uh, really great kings like uh, uh, Emperor Vikramaditya, and uh, we have the uh, Sambat also running from him. And unfortunately, his identification has also been uh, kind of vitiated. So it's a big uh, problem for our history. And in fact, the whole uh, idea for this research in history uh, came from uh, finding out who was the real King Vikmadit. Okay. And we'll come to that uh, in one of the later episodes. One of the later, because you are proceeding serially. So yes. We are reached Ashok. Yes. Uh, and uh, and one of the uh, myths about the Ashok is, and uh, we, we have to, you know, you have to answer that also. And the Buddhism grew because of Ashok, you know, we, we say. And, and Buddhism actually destroyed the Vedic history also because they built their temples or stupa on top of our temples. And most of the sacred places are Buddhist stupa also. Anyway, I'll leave for a presentation so we can get started, uh, Dr. Roy. Excellent. So I will start setting the presentation. Yes, yes, please. please. So thank you, Adityji, again. And... Uh, I'm just making it full screen. So the today's presentation uh, is uh, on one of the most, uh, uh, I would say, a basic foundation uh, of modern history. And uh, that is the identification of uh, Ashok Morj uh, with uh, Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of major rock edicts. <clears throat> so for the background, uh, we have already done, uh, I think, three episodes. And uh, what we have uh, seen uh, is that ancient Indian history has been constructed by going backward and forward uh, from the two uh, seat anchors of Indian history. 
which synchronize Indian history with Greek history. And we have seen this, uh, that these two identifications are uh, the first one around 326 BCE, Alexander um, met Sandrocortus, uh, who is identified as Chandrut Maj. And the second one uh, is around 258 BCE, Devanam Priya Priyadarshi mentions five Greek kings. And that Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, is identified with Ashok Maj. Uh, so what we have done uh, is that we have gone through the identification of Sandrocortus of Greek accounts with Chandgupt Maj. And based upon the examination of the evidence from various sources, and uh, uh, we discussed them in the last episode, all uh, different sources, and uh, we con concluded that there is no clinching evidence in favor of the identification of Sandrocortus of the Greek accounts with Chandgupt Maj. So basically all we have uh, is the identification of Sandrocortus with Chandgupt, but the Maj word is missing from the Greek accounts. So we can only go Chandgupt. And that Chandgupta could be the Chandgupta one of imperial Gupta dynasty as well. So what happens is that the validity of the currently accepted ancient history of India then rests on the second seat anchor, which is the identification of Devanampriya Priyadarshi of major rock edits with Ashok Maj. So this is the subject of discussion today. But what is the evidence for this identification? Uh, can we be really sure that Devanam Priya Priyadarshi was uh, the Ashok Maj? So this identification of Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, was proposed by James Princep uh, in 1838. And uh, as we see in this uh, uh, quote here, uh, that uh, he was working uh, with another researcher, uh, Mr. Turner, uh, who was uh, researching the history of uh, Sri Lanka. And Mr. Turner fixes the date of Ashoka's accession in BC 247, or 62 years subsequent to Chandragupta, the contemporary of Seleucus. Now, many of his edicts are dated in the 28th year, that is in BC 219, or six years after Antiochus the Great had mounted the throne. So here we see uh, that, uh, uh, as you know, one of the five kings is uh, Antiochus. And in this one, and this gets very interesting, and we'll uh, get to it uh, in the next episode, is that uh, the Antiochus is not a unique uh, king. So there were many Antiochus. And in this one, the very first time when James Prince of identifies uh, Devanam Priya Priyadasi with Ashok Maj, he identifies his contemporary as Antiochus the Great. And he gives the year as BC 219, but uh, 219 BCE. But we have seen, uh, in just uh, the uh, previous slides, that right now the historians uh, consider that to have happened in 258 BCE. And they have changed that Antiochus uh, from Antiochus the Great to Antiochus II. And this has a major bearing on this identification. And we will discuss that uh, in the next episode. So, this is the 13th uh, rock edit. And uh, we have seen uh, this slide before, uh, which identifies the five. Uh, Greek kings. So this is the 13th uh, rock edict of the major rock edicts. There are total 14 of them. And this one is uh, really a long uh, edict. And we are going to go through it uh, uh, fully uh, today. And uh, this uh, mentions uh, these five kings, where the Yon king Antioch, uh, which is uh, identified with Antiochus. And beyond this Anti Antioch, we have got four kings, Turma, Antikini, Maka, Alex Sudar, and we are going to uh, go through the identifications of uh, these kings. So what happens? <clears throat> Is that uh, we already had uh, uh, researchers in India uh, who proposed that uh, Sandokotas was not Chandgupta Maj, uh, but uh, he was Chandgupta one. But what about this? evidence then. What about these five kings? So if uh, uh, their uh, theory is right, uh, then uh, this uh, Ashok uh, happened a long time back, but he mentions these five uh, Greek kings. So how uh, do we solve this problem? So one of the 
uh, proposals was uh, by Pandit Kot, Kota Venkat Shalam, and uh, I uh, have a great respect for him. Uh, from his books, I have learned a lot. Uh, and he says that the so-called inscriptions of Ashoka do not belong to Ashoka. Most of them do not make any mention of Ashoka. If one or two mention Ashoka, they do not refer to Ashoka Vardhan of the Maurya dynasty, but they refer to Samudragupta of the Gupta dynasty, which assumed the title of Ashoka Ditya. So basically, uh, he is saying uh, that uh, his identification is that uh, this uh, Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, was Samudragupta. And uh, he says that uh, Samudragupta had assumed the title of Ashoka Ditya. Uh, but the problem is, uh, I have not found any evidence uh, that Samudragupta ever took the title Ashoka Ditya. So uh, I'm not sure uh, how uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Soma Yajuluji, uh, how did he uh, get that information? Uh, because I have not seen it. So, so this identification uh, is uh, uh, not uh, uh, tenable. Then the other one, uh, and this one is uh, uh, by uh, Sri Vyas, Vyas Sissiji, and he has written uh, many books, uh, great books. Uh, this, this one is from Purano Metias. And uh, basically, they are trying to find out uh, a way around uh, this evidence because the evidence is very strong. And uh, this uh, has to be explained properly if uh, uh, we are going to uh, uh, get a credible uh, Indian history and alternative to what is there right now. And then he says that uh, these five, the Antioch, Turmai, Antikini, Maga, and Alixudar uh, are not kings, but the names of regions uh, on the frontiers of ancient India in second millennium BC, the time of Ashok Marj. So he is saying that uh, though these major rock edicts are written by Ashok Marj, uh, but the timing is second millennium BC, long time uh, before Ashoka's time uh, that we believe right now. And these were the regions. So, but the problem is uh, that uh, we have already seen this uh, edict and these five, Antioch, Turmai, Antikini, uh, Maga, Alixudar, they are described as kings in the edict. They are not uh, described as uh, different regions uh, at the frontier. And also they, uh, the names also do not look like uh, the name of regions. So we say that the alternative explanations uh, that have been provided uh, that uh, uh, do not really explain the evidence. They, they, uh, are uh, they fall short. Now, uh, there is another problem uh, with uh, this identification, and that is that in uh, April of 1958, a rock inscription was found, and uh, this is in uh, this place, Sari Kuna, uh, near Kandahar, uh, in southern Afghanistan. And this is a bilingual uh, inscription. So this has got uh, Greek, uh, in Greek as well as in Aramaic. So what happens is that uh, this tells you that uh, Whoever this Devanam Priya Pridarsi was, uh, his time was after the invasion of India by Alexander. Because this uh, bilingual inscription, uh, this presupposes the existence of Greek colonies. Because unless there are Greek colonies there, why would uh, he have uh, his edicts in uh, uh, this uh, Greek? So basically, uh, uh, Setna and uh, Dr. K. D. Setna, let uh, Dr. K. D. Setna, and uh, I have mentioned him before. Uh, his uh, books uh, are uh, very valuable uh, for uh, our history. And uh, he proposed that the Greek part of the inscription uh, is a much later addition to the original in Aramaic. Uh, again, uh, though, this uh, argument is weak because there is no uh, supporting evidence. And especially when these five names can be identified with actual uh, historical Greek kings, uh, uh, and uh, those are all uh, after the invasion of Alexander uh, the Great. So basically, uh, it seems that uh, the evidence in support of the uh, current uh, timeline of Indian history as established by uh, modern histor historians uh, is uh, uh, very strong. But if the modern historians are right, then the information about uh, this Devanam Priya Priyadarsi, uh, known from major rock edits, must match with the information about Ashok Marj from uh, known from the literature. And the question is, does it match? So basically what we have uh, is that uh, we have got uh, Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, of these uh, major rock edicts. And nowhere uh, on those major rock edicts, 
he calls himself Ashok Mauds. So he only calls them Devanam Priya Pridarshi said so. And we have identified with him with Ashok Mauds. But he has got uh, given information about him, about his thinking, about his philosophy uh, in those major rock edits. And this Ashok Mauds, uh, he is known from the literature, from the Buddhist literature. The question is, the information that is in the major rock edits, does it match with the information that is available uh, in literature about Ashok Mauds? Because if they are two, uh, the same, then it must match. So what are uh, the sources of information? Uh, the information uh, uh, about uh, Ashok Mauds uh, is uh, uh, given in this uh, uh, paper by Professor Basam. Uh, he has written a wonderful book, The Wonder uh, That Was India. And it, it tells you that we have got sources of information about Ashoka, the Chronicles of Sri Lanka, the Ashoka Vadan, uh, which uh, is preserved in the book, uh, bigger book, Divya Vadan. And then we have records of Chinese pilgrims. Uh, we have Raj Tarangani of Kalhan and we have the Puranas. And in the Chronicles of Sri Lanka, we have uh, uh, two books, Deep Ones and Maha Ones. And uh, for the rec uh, records of Chinese pilgrims, uh, we know that uh, very famous uh, pilgrims, Fahian and Huensang. So these are our sources of information that uh, tell us about Ashoka. And uh, for the information about uh, uh, Devanam Priya Pridarshi, uh, we have got uh, these 14 major rock edicts. And the most important of them uh, that I have been talking about is the 13th, 13th one, uh, 13th rock edict, uh, which mentions all these five Greek kings. So what we have here uh, is the 13th rock edict, and uh, it's a long one, but it's a very important one. So we need to uh, uh, go through it. And it says, when King Devanam Priya Pedasi uh, had been anointed eight years uh, of the, uh, the Kalinga was conquered by him. So 150,000 in number were the men who were deported. 100,000 uh, in number were those uh, who were slain, and many times as many those who died. After that, now that the country of the Kalinga has been taken, Devanam Priya is devoted to a zealous study of morality, to the love of morality and to the instruction of people in morality. This is the repentance of Devanam Priya on account of his conquest of the country of Kalinga. So you can see uh, here, he describes the devastation uh, that was brought upon uh, Kalinga. And uh, this devastation uh, is what changed him. For this is considered very painful and deplorable by Devanam Priya that while one is conquering an unconquered uh, country, slaughter, death, and deportation of people uh, are taking place there. But the following is considered even more uh, deplorable uh, than this by Devanam Priya to the Brahmanaj, Sramanaj, or other sects or householders who are living there, and among whom the following are practiced obedience to those who receive high pay, obedience to mother and father, obedience to elders proper courtesy to friends, acquaintances, companions, and relatives, to slaves and servants from devotion uh, to these uh, then happen injury or uh, slaughter or deportation of lived ones. So he continues uh, with the aftermath of uh, uh, this devastating war uh, with Kalinga. And he continues, or if there are then incurring misfortune, the friends, acquaintances, companions, and relatives of those who whose affection is undiminished, although they are themselves well provided for, this misfortune as well becomes an injury uh, to those uh, persons themselves. This is shared by all men and is considered deplorable by Devanam Priya. And there is no place where men are not indeed attached uh, to some sect. Therefore, even the hundredth part or thousandth part of all those uh, people who were slain, who died and who were deported at that time in Kaling uh, would now be considered very deplorable uh, by Devanam Priya. So you can see uh, that uh, he changed completely uh, after this war. So this war is very, very, a very, very important, the most important event in the life of this Devanam Priya Priyadarsi. And Devanam Priya thinks that even to one who should uh, wrong him, what can be forgiven is to be forgiven. And even the inhabitants of the forests, which are included in the dominions of Devanam Priya, 
even those he pacifies and converts, and they are told of the power to punish them, uh, which Devanampriya possesses, in spite of his repentance, in order that they may be ashamed of their crimes and may not be killed. For Devanampriya desires towards all beings abstention from hurting, self-control, impartiality in case of violence, and this conquest is considered the principal one by Devanampriya, the conquest by morality. So we see that uh, he is a completely uh, changed person uh, in the aftermath of the Kalinga War. And here uh, we come uh, to the crucial evidence, and uh, uh, this part of this uh, we have seen before, uh, is that and this conquest has been won repeatedly by Devanampriya, both here and among all his borders, even as far as at the distance of 600 Yojan, where the Yon king named Antioch is ruling, and beyond this Antioch, where four uh, kings are ruling. So they are all kings, named Turmay, named Antikini, named Maka, named Alik Sudar, and toward the south, where the uh, Cholas and the Pandyas are ruling as far as Tamparni. Likewise, here in the king's territory, among the Yonas and Kamboyas, uh, so that's Kamboj, uh, among the Navaks and Nabitis, among the Vojas and Pitinikas, among the Andhras and Palidas, everywhere people are con forming to Devanampriya's instruction in morality. So basically he tells you that uh, he not only converted uh, to Buddhism, but he was spreading the message to all uh, over his kingdom and beyond his kingdoms. And uh, he mentions all these uh, uh, different kingdoms. And even those to whom the envoys of Devanampriya do not go, uh, having heard of the duties of morality, the ordinances and the instruction uh, in morality of Devanampriya, are conforming to morality and will conform to it. This conquest, which has been won uh, by this everywhere, a conquest won everywhere and repeatedly causes the feeling of satisfaction. Satisfaction has been obtained by me at the conquest by morality. But this satisfaction is indeed of little consequence. Devanampriya thinks that only the fruits in the other world are of great value. Uh, so basically, uh, he's uh, saying uh, that uh, uh, he's doing good karma uh, for the afterlife, which uh, he values very much. And then he continues. Uh, this is a, a long uh, uh, edict, the 13th one, and the most important one. And for the following purpose, uh, has this rescript on morality been written uh, in order that the sons and great-grandsons who may be born to me should not think that fresh conquest ought to be made, that if a conquest does please them, they should take pleasure uh, in mercy and light punishments. And they should uh, regard the conquest by morality as the only true conquest. This conquest bears fruit in this world and in the other world. And let there be uh, to them pleasure in the abandonment of all other aims, which is pleasure in morality. For this uh, bears fruit in this world and in the other world. So this uh, tells you about uh, his thinking uh, when these uh, uh, major uh, rock edicts uh, uh, were being uh, written uh, at his command. Uh, and uh, he, he's a totally changed man. Uh, so we have gone through uh, this evidence, and uh, now we uh, go through uh, different points. So basically, uh, here, we'll discuss how does uh, Devanam Priya Priyadasi uh, compare uh, with Ashok Marja. So the first point uh, is the conquest of Kaling. And what we have, and we have seen it clearly in this set, uh, Rock Edict 13 that uh, we just went through, the conquest of Kaling and the remorse from the ravages of war were the most important events in the life of Devanampriya Priyadarshi. But the, these events find no mention in the literature about Ashok Mars. The Kaling war was the turning point in the life of Devanampriya Priyadarshi. We have seen that uh, in this edict. When he decided to change his ways, preach non-violence, and start following the teachings of Buddhism. So he converted to Buddhism because of this Kaling war. But the lit uh, literature, in the literature about Ashok Morch, and there is plenty of them, uh, there is no mention of Kaling war. So how can literary sources be silent about the Kaling war if Ashok Morch was Devanam Priya Priyadarsi? Uh, and uh, here is uh, this uh, paper, uh, the quote from the paper by Professor Basam, uh, who was author of The Wonder That Was India. And he says, one would expect the compilers of this cycle of legends to have recorded the story of the Kaling War and Ashoka's repentance and embroidered it with many supernatural incidents. Instead, they ignored it. So here uh, you have a, 
a statement uh, from Professor Basam that there is no mention of Kaling War anywhere in the literature, all the literature about Ashok Moyes. There is no mention of Kaling War. And this Kaling War is the most important event uh, in the life of Devanam Priya Piyadarshi. You see, there is no match between Devanam Priya Piyadarshi and Ashok Moyes. And then uh, we come to the conversion uh, to Buddhism. So we have seen that the conversion to Buddhism uh, of Devanam Priya Piyadarshi of major rock edicts happened because of the Kaling War. But what do we find uh, in the literature? And here we have a, a quote uh, from the travel notes of Fahiyan. And this is a very interesting one. And it tells you, when King Asoka in a former birth uh, was a little boy and played on the road, he met Kasyap Buddha walking. The stranger begged food and the boy pleasantly took a handful of earth and gave it to him. The Buddha uh, took the earth and returned it to the ground on which he was walking. Because of this, the boy received the recompense of becoming a king uh, of the iron wheel to rule over Jambudweep. Once when he was making a judicial tour of inspection through Jambudweep, he saw between the iron uh, circuit of the two hills uh, Narak for the punishment of wicked men. Having thereupon asked his ministers what sort of a thing it was, they replied, it belongs to Yama, the king of demons, uh, for punishing wicked people. The king thought within himself. Even the king of demons uh, is able to make a narak in which to deal with wicked men. Uh, why should not I, uh, who am I the lord of men, make a narak in which to deal with the wicked men? He forthwith asked his ministers uh, who could make for him a narak and preside over the punishment of wicked people uh, in it. They replied that it was only a man of extreme wickedness uh, who could make it. And the king thereupon sent officers to seek everywhere for such a bad man. And they saw by the side of a pond a man tall and strong with a black countenance, yellow hair and green eyes, hooking up the fish uh, with his feet while he called to him birds and beasts. And when they came, uh, then sought and killed them so that no, not one escaped. Having got this man, they took him to the king uh, who secretly charged him, uh, you must make a square enclosure with high walls, plant in it all kinds of flowers and fruits, make good ponds in it for uh, bathing, make it grand and imposing in every way so that men shall look uh, to it with thirsting desire, make it get strong and sure. And when anyone enters, instantly seize him and punish him as a sinner, uh, not allowing him to get out. Even if I should enter, punish me as a sinner uh, in the same way and do not let me go. I now appoint you master of that narak. Soon after this, a bhikshu, pursuing his regular course of begging his food, entered the gate. When the lictors of the Narak saw him, uh, they were about to subject him to their tortures. But he, frightened, begged them to allow him a moment in which to eat his midday meal. Immediately after that, there came in another man whom they thrust into a mortar and pounded till a red froth overflowed. As the bhikshu looked on, there came to him the thought of the impermanence, the painful suffering and insanity of this body and how it is, but as a bubble and as foam, and instantly he attained to Arhatship. Immediately after, Lictor seized him and threw him into a cauldron of boiling water. There was a look of joyful satisfaction, however, in the bhikshu's countenance. The fire was extinguished and the water became cold. In the middle of the cauldron, uh, there rose up a lotus flower with the bhikshu seated on it. The lictors at once went and reported to the king that there was a marvelous occurrence uh, in the Narak and wished him to go and see it. But the king said, I formerly made such an agreement that now I dare not go the, to that place. The lictor said, this is not a small matter. Your majesty ought to go quickly. Let your former agreement be altered. The king thereupon followed them and entered the Narak when uh, the bhikshu preached the law to him and he believed and was made free. Forthwith, he demolished the Narak and repented, repented of all the evil uh, which he had formerly done. From that time, he believed in and honored the three precious ones and constantly went to a patra tree, repenting under it with self-reproach of his errors and accepting the eight rules of abstinence. And uh, this you can see uh, given the reference uh, uh, from the book by J. Lege, A Record of Buddhist Kingdoms. Uh, 
So what we see is that the, according to Rock Edict 13, the Kaling War was the main factor behind the conversion of Devanam Priye Priyadarshi to Buddhism. And uh, according to the travel notes of Fahiyan, we just quoted it, Ashoka was converted by a Buddhist monk uh, who was being tortured by Ashoka and with no relation to the Kaling War. If you go to according, uh, if you go to another tradition of Buddhism, according to Theravada uh, tradition, Ashok Maj was converted by a seven-year-old monk uh, with no relation to the Kaling War. So clearly there is no match between Devanam Priya Priyadasi of major rock edicts and Ashok Maj as known from literature. Now we go to the third point, uh, which is the family. Now we know uh, that Ashoka uh, had sent his son Mahendra and daughter Sangmitra uh, to Sri Lanka to spread Buddhism. But there is no mention of them uh, in the edicts of Devanam Priya Priyadarshi. Now we have uh, an inscription uh, uh, by Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, on the Allahabad pillar, uh, in which he says uh, that his wife was Karwaki and his son was Tivar. But both Karwaki and Tivar, they are not mentioned in literary sources about Ashok Maj. So what we have is that uh, from literary sources, we have Mahendra and Sangmitra, but they are not mentioned in the major rock edicts. The edicts say the wife was Karwaki and the son was Tivar, but they are not uh, anywhere in the literature. And uh, you see here uh, from the fifth rock edict, uh, this is the fifth rock edict, and uh, this says, they are occupied everywhere here and in all the outlying towns in the harems of my brothers, of my sisters, and of whatever other relatives of mine there are. Those uh, Mahamatyas of morality are occupied everywhere uh, in my dominions uh, with those who are devoted to morality in order to ascertain whether one is eager for morality uh, or established in morality or furnished with gifts for the following purpose. Has this rescript on morality been written? Uh, it may be of long duration that uh, my descendants may conform to it. So what we see here, he is talking about the harams of my brothers, of my sisters. He's talking about his brothers and sisters in the fifth rock edict. She talks about brothers and sisters, but according to the deep ones and maha ones, uh, this is the literature about Ashok Maj, and uh, it's very famous. We uh, know that Ashoka had killed all his 99 step brothers save his own brother, Tissa. There is no uh, mention of the killing of stepbrothers in any of the inscription, inscriptions. So what we have in the, uh, in the literature says uh, that Ashoka killed all his stepbrothers, just save one brother whose name was Tissa. But there is no mention of Tissa in any of the inscriptions. So what you find here uh, is very strange that not a single person that is common to both literary sources about Ashok Maj and the inscriptions of Devanam Priya Pridarsi. There is not a single person who matches. The ones in the literature, the ones mentioned uh, about Ashok Maj, none of them is mentioned in any of the uh, rock edicts or the pillar edicts. And anyone, uh, the names that are mentioned in the uh, edicts, uh, we have gone through the Karwaki and Tivar, uh, they are not mentioned anywhere in literature uh, about Ashok Maj. So when you see these uh, movies, uh, like uh, there was a movie uh, on Ashoka, and you saw this uh, uh, Karuwaki, a queen. Uh, but those are based upon this identification of uh, Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, with Ashok Maj. There is uh, uh, no independent evidence for that. Now we come to the fourth point, And uh, this again gets very interesting. And this is on vegetarianism. Now what happens uh, is that uh, we have mention of Ashoka uh, in Kalhans, Raj Tarangani. And this is uh, 1.101 to 102. And uh, I have uh, produced it here. And it says here, Prapotra Sakunet Satasya Bhupate Prapritri Vyaja Athavahad Sokakya Satya Sando Vasundharam Yahasantu Vrijino Raja Prapanno Jin Sasanam Susk Kaletra Vitas Tatro Tastar Stup Mandale. So this is very important in evidence because talk is talking about Ashok Maharaj. You see there, uh, it's saying uh, Ashok Akya. So it's talking about Ashok. But what he's saying, uh, Jin Sasanam. So what he's saying is that the king was a Jain before and then he converted to Buddhism. 
and uh, this is also uh, corroborated uh, from the jain accounts and we know from the jain accounts that chandgupt mauryj uh, with the grandfather of ashok mauryj was a jain uh, who had spent the later days of his life serving the jain uh, saint bhadrabahu and ashoka's grandson samprati is considered the constantine of jainism uh, he did for jainism what ashoka did for buddhism so what we have is that his grandfather uh, was a devout uh, jain and the grandson was also a devout jain so it's natural to assume that ashok mauryj was born a jain and uh, we have a confirmation of that from raj tarangini but the jains and buddhists both are vegetarians so basically ashok mauryj was a vegetarian before uh, and after a conversion uh, to buddhism but what did uh, does uh, devanam priya pedarsi say in his first rock edict he says this formerly in the kitchen of king devanam priya pedarsin many hundred thousands of animals were killed daily for the sake of curry but now when this rescript on morality is written then only three animals are being killed daily uh, two peacocks and a deer even this deer uh, not regularly even these three animals shall not be killed in future so what we have is that uh, hundreds of thousands of animals were being killed but devanam priya pedarsi was a uh, the ashok mauryj uh, was a jain before so there should not have been any killing before so this is uh, incompatible or uh, contradictory information uh, if ashok was always a vegetarian first as a jain and then as a buddhist so basically what you have uh, is that this devanam priya pedarsi uh, was a, a strong hindu king before uh, who uh, did not mind uh, uh, this uh, serving of these uh, animals Uh, but uh, after he turned buddhist uh, then he stopped it so there we have a conflicting uh, information uh, about ashok mauryj being devanam priya priyadarshi and uh, the final uh, piece of evidence uh, is on the tolerance so ashoka who is considered an apostle of non violence uh, was not tolerant even after his conversion to buddhism and this fact uh, probably is uh, not known to many people and here i have a quote uh, uh, from uh, this uh, a uh, book by muko padhay and it says of uh, about an event uh, during that uh, time ashok mauryj was ruling and he had already uh, become a buddhist see he was a buddhist and he says a follower uh, of the nirgrantha mahavir uh, painted a picture showing buddha prostrating himself at the feet of nirgrantha ashok ordered all the ajivkas uh, of pundravardhan uh, north bengal uh, to be killed in one day 18000 ajivkas uh, lost their lives a similar kind of incident took place in the town of patliputra a man who painted such a picture uh, was burned alive with his family it was announced that whoever would bring the king the head of a nirgrantha would be rewarded with a dinar a gold coin as a result of this thousands of uh, nirgranthas lost their lives so basically uh, what you have here uh, is an event uh, in which uh, and you know that ajivikas were another important uh, uh, religious group uh, during that time uh, besides uh, jains and buddhists and uh, the ajiviks uh, tried to show that uh, uh, their guru uh, uh, was uh, superior to buddhism uh, to buddha so he made a picture showing a uh, buddha prostrating himself at the feet of nirgantha and uh, this uh, enraged ashoka so much and of course he say that the buddha was made to prostrate so this automatically means that ashoka was already a buddhist if he got so enraged and he got like 18000 people killed in a day so this is a major massacre uh, that happened uh, at the or, uh, order of ashok mauryj now this is uh, in contrast to, to the character of devanam priya pedarsi who had completely given up violence after accepting buddhism uh, and we have seen this in the 13th major rock edict and this is what he says and devanam priya thinks that even to one who should wrong him what can be forgiven is to be forgiven and even the inhabitants of the forests which are included in the dominions of devanam priya even though he pacifies and converts and they are told uh, of the power to punish them when devanam priya possesses in spite of his repentance in order that they may be ashamed of their crimes and may not be killed for devanam priya desires towards all beings abstention from hurting self control uh, impartiality 
uh, in case of violence. And this conquest is considered the principal one by Devanam Priya with the conquest uh, by morality. So you see that uh, this Devanam Priya Pedasi is a completely changed man. And uh, he will not uh, indulge uh, in the kind of uh, uh, violence, uh, it's the massacre uh, that Ashok Maharaj uh, indulged in even after having been converted. So you clearly see uh, that uh, this does not match the Devanam Priya Pedasi of major rock addicts. Uh, is completely different uh, from Ashok Maharaj. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, we have gone through uh, evidence and uh, this, these facts should create doubts in our minds uh, about Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of major rock addicts and Ashok Maharaj being the same person. And based on the examination of the evidence uh, from various sources, uh, it can be concluded that there is no clinching evidence in favor of the identification of Devanam Priya Priyadarshi uh, with Ashok Maharaj. If the Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of the inscriptions uh, does not match uh, with the Ashok Maharaj known from the literature, then we must look beyond Ashok Maharaj and search for the real uh, Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of major rock addicts. So if the Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of major rock addicts why not Ashok Maharaj, then who was the Devanam Priya Priyadarshi of major rock addicts? So I will discuss an alternative uh, identification of the Devanam Priya Pridarsi of major rock edits in the next presentation. So I would like to thank uh, Sri Aditya Satsangiji uh, for giving me this opportunity and Dr. Mahendra Thakur uh, for organizing uh, this talk. And uh, if you want to contact me, uh, this is my uh, email, rajaramohanrai108 at gmail.com. And... Uh, can also reach me by Twitter, blog, or Academia. Thank you so much, Adityji. Thank you so much. What a beautiful presentation. And you completely destroyed Ashoka mystery, actually, in this presentation. You know, because most of the people do not are not aware. People usually say that the Ashoka, the real Ashoka converted. But you conclusively proved that it was second Ashoka which was converted, not the first one. You know, so it, it is so good uh, with the inscriptions and everything. I hope the Indian historians see this and report it in their history books. Because so far we have been told Ashoka converted to Buddhism and that's how Buddhism spread. This is a fake narrative. So, uh, uh, Raja Ramun Raji, one personal question. Now, you have proved it with the, these inscriptions. Now, did any other Indian historian also find it out? Or were they even interested in finding it out? Uh, surprisingly not. I have not uh, come across uh, anybody uh, who has analyzed it uh, uh, in so much detail. And uh, so people uh, are aware of, uh, like, you know that uh, for a long time, even from the British time itself, the first one that Sandro caught us uh, was not Chandukta Marge, but it was Chandukta One, And uh, that uh, has been known. But the second one, uh, this is piece of evidence is uh, very complicated and we are going to go through it uh, in the next one. And you'll see that it's uh, almost like a solving a, de a detective a crime. That, that's what it is, basically, going through this literature. And really, I mean, this is an amazing piece of evidence uh, that uh, it, it seems that it is a soak march. Uh, there is a uh, because there are minor rock edicts that say they were pre a pre a soak. But we can go, we'll go through this detail, all these five kings. It's, it's a very, very fascinating. And uh, nobody has gone through the details that I have gone through. No, this is a remarkable study, I think, uh, because nobody, I have not seen anyone. That's why I asked you the question. I have not seen anyone conclusively proving like this. People speak about it. There are a lot of articles written and a lot of people speak about it. And I have, I have been forwarded many things. But uh, some people have, many people have not come on the videos and shown this. Uh, and uh, with the proof, I think that's a major fact. If this changes, then the entire Christian narrative changes. Because uh, the, the, most of the Christianity took teachings of Buddhism. We all know that Petra was a major Hin Buddhist center, Petra, on which all the Islamic uh, ideologies are based on. Uh, oh, sorry, Abrahamic ideologies are based on. And uh, we all know that Petra was a major center of Buddhism also. And which changes a lot of things actually, and uh, on also the Buddhism Buddhist influence on New Testament also changes because uh, it was modified significantly in incorporating Buddhist teachings, and uh, so Parsi and other areas. The great presentation. One last question to you. 
is that uh, you live in Canada and Canadian universities continue with the old theories. So are you doing any effort with the Canadian universities to change their version? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Aditi. Uh, actually, no, uh, because uh, uh, um, the time is limited. So, I mean, I got to uh, work and uh, that takes a lot of time and then family. And this is only, uh, you know, like uh, just for my interest, if, uh, just for the love of my civilization, uh, spending a lot of time on it. But uh, I don't have really time to uh, go and engage uh, with others, at least not at this time. Uh, when the time comes, probably we'll do it. Hopefully the message goes uh, uh, spreads uh, with these talks and people become aware and uh, then hopefully uh, people will look uh, deeper into it. Thank you so much and thank you all the viewers for watching. Do let us know feedback by commenting on it and you can ask many questions to Dr. Roy himself and uh, we'll be very happy and I think if he's watching the videos he'll answer you back. Thank you and Namaste. Namaskar ji. Thank, thank you. you.